Well, what an extraordinary turnout. Thank you so much for everybody uh, for who's, uh, who's bothered to come here. Um, I'm Valdemar Inostrak, I'm, I'm an art critic, um, and I'm here for one reason only, uh, which is that I've been admiring Matt's art for quite a long time, um, always been intrigued by it, always wanted to find out more about it. Um, so I'm just a fan, it's that simple. Um, and my job here, I hope, will be to prompt him and, and get him to say uh, more about the show, tell us a little bit about his major drives. Um, there'll be a little thing at the end for um, questions from the audience, so please take advantage of that. Uh, but I, I suppose the thing we all want to know at the moment is what's going on in this show. Um, what are Matt's ambitions for it? What do the different pieces set out to do? So that's what I'm going to start with. Uh, and I'm just going to start with the title of the show, The Centrifugal Soul, um, and ask Matt where that came from, what it means, how we should be reading it. Okay, hi everybody and thanks for coming along and thanks for agreeing to do this, Voldemort. Apologies to anybody who's read the catalogue essay or even read the press release and they know what I'm going to say about the centrifugal soul because it's it, there in all these documents. Um, I was asked to be in an exhibition in Mona in Tasmania, big museum, at the end of last year and there were four different curators. One of them was Jeffrey Miller, who's an evolutionary biologist, evolutionary psychologist. And he was the curator of the section of the show that I was in and he'd written several books on his theory as to why we behaved in the way we do. And he was using certain ideas from evolution to, to explain our behavior. And one of the things that he talks about is how obsessed we're becoming with presenting an image of ourselves to other people, to our friends and people we don't know, to the outside world. And he was saying that although this appears very superficially shallow, it actually has very deep roots. And he talks about various animals, particularly birds of paradise, that have very exotic plumages and do very... Um, enchanting little courtship rituals and for them their appearance is all designed towards attracting a mate and the little dance that they do is all about seduction and he's saying that it's pretty much the same thing so it's kind of okay to behave in that way but because of the uh, acceleration of certain aspects of modern living such as social media that we're getting a little bit carried away with showing off and all of this attention on our surface appearance, we're projecting all ourselves to the outside, uh, and our surface is becoming like our, our main preoccupation in our relationship with other people. And he was saying that because of this, we're, li we're losing something at our core, and that thing is qualities such as dignity and reticence. And just those... Um, aspects that we might have spent a little bit more time on before. So the centrifugal soul was basically our soul being spun out to the outside so that everything is on this skin on the surface for other people to look at and judge us by. And, and, the, and our core is empty and, and this emptiness needs addressing. This was the central, central principle that I decided to take and make my exhibition here about. So it's a, it, it's a, a show with social and socio-political ambitions in that sense, which, which I find quite surprising because it's not something you feel when you walk into it. It is, but it's not really the way that I came about that. My interest isn't so like uh, academic. Um, for me, like everybody else, I'm just trying to make sense of the world. And because I'm, I'm an artist, that's my job. I'm looking a, a lot of the time at the way things are made and how the surface of those, um, those artworks hide meaning behind them. And you're, you're presented with this veneer and then you have to read things into it. So that's something I'm thinking of a lot of the time. And also about various other things that I experience when I'm out there in the world. And when I was a younger, less experienced person, I used to walk down Oxford Street and I get very depressed about all the vis visual pollution that we're constantly confronted by, all the advertising and the branding and everything that's going on there. I just loathed how unnatural it all was. 
until I read something which I think was by Richard Dawkins, who's kind of a, a peer of uh, Jeffrey Miller, and he was saying that all of those, uh, all, all that color and all that design, all that dynamic imagery, it's all part of the branding of these corporations that is the same as the branding that nature presents to us. So an apple or a banana, various fruit, various flowers. It's all about projecting a surface image that somebody's going to come along and recognize and realize when they've consumed that thing that the product they consumed was good. And therefore, if they come back again, it's very easy to recognize that banana shape with the black and yellow skin on it. They can consume it again knowing that the experience is likely to be good. And that's the same thing as the going to a Nike store because you're going to get some decent Nike trainers. And on top of that, sorry to go on because I do bore people with this theory that when you're when you've eaten the banana and you go out into the field and then you defecate and you leave the seed of that banana behind which you've then fertilized that when you come out of the Nike shop and you're wearing the trainers with a little logo on it or you've got the Nike bag with a little tick on it you're disseminating the seed of this company in the same way that it, it, it happens in the natural world so just making sense of that relationship between the surface projected image of something and what's going on below was something that's very kind of ur an urgent matter for me to try and make sense of because it was like bugging me it was just bothering me so that's kind of where i was coming from and then the, the social political implications are embedded in that mm. thing I, I get a very strong sense in the exhibition of the centrifugal aspect of it, the sense that at the heart of it all there's some kind of vacuum. Um, but I'm intrigued by what the imagery on the edges then is about. So most obviously in this show, um, there's the set of paintings of little birds, uh, beautiful little birds, all set in a kind of graffiti land. Um, would that be then the this sort of despoiled world that we're creating outside our vacuum? Is, is that how we should read that? Yes, yeah, so the first work I made was the, the zoetrope, the spinning birds of paradise in the far room. And then I needed something else to make for the exhibition. I decided that I was going to have this work in the show, so I needed some, some other artworks to sit alongside it. And I got like a little terrace where I live, and we've been hanging bird seed up there. So we're getting a lot of um, English garden birds popping up and hovering around, and they're so exquisite, the little flashes of colour as they like, fling themselves around my very urban backyard, that I thought I wanted to make something to do with them, because equally they are announcing their virility by their dynamic colour and design. So it's there, even in our back garden, you don't have to go to Papua New Guinea to experience this. So I wanted to make something with these little guys, but I couldn't really think of a background, a way of... Um, placing them on a background that would elicit something from them that's more than just a bird with a dynamic colour. And it came to me kind of like an accident that a little computer-generated version of the centrifugal soul work, the ones with the bird of paradise, we, we pop some kind of CG shadows into it, and the shadows looked a little bit like graffiti, the way they appeared on the wall, just these random abstract shapes. And then it occurred to me, hmm, graffiti could be an interesting contrast to these very natural-looking birds. And I started thinking about birds being in the city as opposed to being in the country, the fact that they were divorced from their natural environment, and therefore they were competing a lot harder than what they would have been when they were against a predominantly green background. They're suddenly having to compete with all this visual pollution of advertising and graffiti and the various other elements that you experience in the city. So I thought, if I find certain graffiti that kind of matches the, the, the shapes and colours on the birds, I could sit them against that graffiti and then look at home because it's in keeping, but at the same time there's a little sadness there because they're kind of competing against that They've thing. lost their trees. It's, yeah, right. So they're, they're lost within this urban environment. And then I remembered that painting of Carol Fabritius, the goldfinch chained to his little perch, and the, the sadness in that, the fact that it's a Trump Loy painting, so it's an optical illusion, really, right? I mean, it's like a, a bird that can't fly anywhere because it's chained up, but it can't fly anywhere because it's a painting anyway. It's an illusion. And so I thought I could build some of that in there, the fact that... Um, 
these little birds are, they have a libido, they want to compete, they want to impress the females with their, their colourful liveries, but it's not something they particularly want to do out of fun, I mean they might get a bit of pleasure out of the sex, it seems quite short lived, particularly with birds. Uh, and it's something that they're just hardwired to do. It's like um, uh, it's, it's like something that they're just compelled to do without them having any choice over it. They're chained to their libido. So those are the kind of elements that I was trying to get in the paintings. And, and presumably in the zoetrope as well, because there's a kind of repetitive, automatic aspect to you know the the the, the hummingbirds yeah. taking the nectar and the dis the the. the Birds of Paradise displaying. Yeah. It's all very sort of repetitive sex, isn't it? Yeah. If it is about that. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted them, everything to, in the show to look kind of, kind of uh, intriguing and entertaining and accessible and beautiful, but there to be a slightly sinister side behind it all, a slightly sad si side behind it all, and that repetition and the mechanistic movement of these birds. Uh, first of all, it's kind of quite quite a buzz to see them and then when you see it a few times the mechanistic element of it becomes apparent and you realize that these things are just like little performing monkeys doing their little ritual which is something that they're compelled to do and they don't really have much choice over it. Let's talk a little bit about the, your interest in these um, um, Victorian mostly uh, projection plans and, and weird machines for doing things. I mean, it's one of the things I've, I've most often noted about your work. Um, so here you've got the zoetrope, which is this curious early kind of animation, isn't it, Victorian machine? So you can tell us a little bit about that. But then also you've got that gigantic tree um, in the other piece, which again is a, as far as I can gather, it's a kind of old Victorian trick that you've updated. Why, why would I use those techniques? Yes. Are you saying? Yeah. Um, I don't know why really that I kind of moved to the, the Victorian era to start picking various aspects from. I, th I think it was like an era that was very significant in being like the, the crucible of the Industrial Revolution and it kind of formed everything that happened later in the 20th century. There was this huge acceleration of growth which made allow the 20th century to be what it was. But also there's a very strong reaction against the Victorian era in art during the 20th century. And we suddenly banished all those ideas on all of those... Uh, all of those... Um, subject matter that had haunted art for thousands of years or certainly many hundreds of years were banished and uh, figuration was became unfashionable and uh, abstraction was uh, certainly important and conceptual art took over and everything that had gone before that is that the last throes of it occurred during that victorian era which probably not coincidentally was the birth of photography so suddenly we found a way of actually making images of human beings and mountains and trees so that our hat it was compelled to go somewhere else but for me it kind of lost something when it suddenly was no longer this little eye kind of peering into the world and so there's a kind of morbid romanticism that I, I kind of like about going back to the Victorian era and also it's a way of providing a contrast to the way we assimilate information now so we have big flat screen TVs maybe like 4k TV um, 3d cinemas high quality broadband internet and we can assimilate this information so easy with it that we're not really thinking about the delivery system of it it's seamless so when you go back and use technology such as the pepper's ghost or the um the zoetrope you can kind of see the mechanics that go on behind the uh conjuring up of the imagery and you're caught between looking at the mechanism and looking at the image and there's this contrast between the two they're like kind of competing for your attention and generally the image can always win out but you can see what it is that's that's actually making that illusion happen which you can't see with modern media so it's that kind of way of illustrating that. Is it also important that, that those Victorian tricks and, and visual games um, still had a kind of magic to them even today? Yeah and of course the Victorian period was a very big time for magic and it was 
it's like evolving with the scientific revolution. That a lot of people weren't really sure what was actually science and what was superstition, and things of that period became very blurred, which is another interesting aspect of it that we had phosphorescence for the first time an x-ray and suddenly we could see things that the human eye could never seen before ever and that got very confused with seances and various other superstitious behavior right up your street yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. let's talk about the other piece the uh, the big piece with the oak tree in the middle um you, you mentioned it's a pepper's ghost illusion mm -hmm. perhaps you should just tell us what that is um so very old um device for as far as i know it's like kind of the oldest device for creating a kind of an effective illusion of a ghostly presence and they would use it in the theater at performances of hamlet where they would have a ghost meaning a man with a sheet draped over him below stage and then you'd have a bright light shining on him so none of the audience would be able to see this guy with a sheet on him, he'd be kind of like down there, and then we'd be on stage, there'd be a huge diagonal sheet of glass in front of us, and then the audience looking at us through the sheet of glass would also see this reflected image of the ghost that was below them, and he would appear to be part of the scene on stage, except he'd be semi-transparent. So it was something that was very popular, and. Um, <coughs> Is, is still used today in Beyonce concerts or maybe they want to put Tupac on stage with some other artists and they have like an LED screen or projection like I've got and suddenly they've got like a dead artist that's up there on the stage performing with various other artists. Very, very basic lo-fi technology but quite effective. And what have you done with it here then? What, what, tell us about the tree and what you would like us to read from it. Yes, yeah, so I, I had the birds and the graffiti at this point and I knew I needed something in the centre of the gallery. It's quite a big space and my paintings were quite small. And obviously a tree was the solution and I thought about making a tree in bronze but it's been done many times by a lot of artists. It's a lot of work and it's very expensive and didn't really kind of sit very well with what I get up to as an artist. So I started thinking of other ways of making a tree appear in the gallery. And I was thinking about a projection, but the two-dimensionality of a projection just hanging there didn't seem to perform the job very well. I, need, I thought it needs something more. And I'd done a couple of little, very small Pepper's Ghost sculptures and thought if it could like hang there as this optical illusion and you could see through it, so it would hang like a ghost in the middle of the space, that could be a way round of doing it. And then I s remembered the major oak, Robin Hood's tree, which I'd made a work with before quite a long time ago. It wasn't very successful, but this tree struck me as being very interesting because other than the fact that it's apparently the oldest tree in oldest oak tree in England, it's a tree that looks like it just wants to die. It's a thousand years old, but it's held up by these steel supports and chains inside the tree that are just holding it up there. And particularly in middle of winter, it looks at like a very forlorn figure there. And the reason that it's being held up, of course, is because of its significance, I think, I assume, to the tourist industry, because it's the hiding place of Robin Hood and his merry men, apparently. It's in Sherwood Forest. And they get a lot of people come to see it, so it's, it's a very popular destination. So I thought maybe I could tie this tree idea in with the fact that certain things can have such mythological significance to us that we prefer to believe in the idea over the actuality of what it is, that this tree just wants to die, but because we want it to live, we want that story to carry on, then we'll keep it propped up. So the whole thing is kind of like an illusion, really, this um, quite crudely constructed illusion. And I then thought if I'd laser scan this tree which is what we've got upstairs you get this quite ghostly effect to it so instead of it being a photograph or a film you surveyors use them a lot you just project an image onto a surface it reflects back into your little scanner and it re reads that repoint as being that the reads it as data as like i hit a surface there 
And if you do that often enough around the tree, you have data, which is then basically a tree which you can rotate around and do what you want with. So I laser scan the major oak, and then I set my camera on a path around it in post-production. So I finish up with a video, which is a very, very slow pan around this very ghostly looking spectral presence of the tree. And one of the things that I was thinking about when I was making it was that it was this perfect idea for the Brexit situation that we were in at that time, that people are desperately trying to hold, hold on to this idea of, a, of an old England when we had full employment and there were no immigrants and everything was hunky-dory. And that, that may be a bit of illusion, that we're always in tumult and all, things are always changing, but it's, it's, very, it's very endearing, this idea of this, this cosy country when everything was as it should be, and, and very dear to a lot of us for, for, for good reason, but that we wanted to believe in, in, in the fiction and the myth over the reality. So that's Old people on crutches, that. basically. Is what Old people on crutches, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's hollow, isn't it? The tree's hollow. That's where Robin yes. Hood and his, and his merry yeah, men were meant to have hidden. That's where they slipped in. So yeah. that's the centrifugal vacuum again, isn't it? Uh, and, the, and the hollowness at the centre of it all, yeah. And the tree itself is a kind of hollowness because it looks it's dead and it's deserted. The birds have been spun outwards by its very slow centrifugal force and are splattered on the outside walls of the gallery. And that kind of represents the kernel, the hollow core at the centre of all this colour and showing off. Now, um, I wrote um, an essay for your catalogue, which I was delighted to be asked to do. Um, and clearly, I got an awful lot wrong, because just hearing to you talk now, um, I wonder what sort of nonsense I put in the catalogue. But one of the, the, one of the strong ideas, which I think we're sort of uh, agreeing on, is this idea of, of a sort of paradise that's been lost. Um, because, you know, you've got your birds of paradise, you've got all these early evolutionary realities of life which have been spoiled to some degree. Um, it, was, I, was I wrong to, to bring all that stuff in or is there something of that to be, to be discerned here? Yeah, I was very happy when you brought it in, but I hadn't been thinking about it that much. I, was just, I just wanted to incorporate it as soon as I read it and thought, pretend <laughs> that it was my intention. But kind of subconsciously, I was thinking of this very fertile tree in the zoetrope with all the birds of paradise, this bush of activity that was happening. And then in the second room, which is the more contemporary room, that the, the, the tree was this hollow, deserted place. So it just sits in very well with the Garden of Eden. Eden and the tree of, of knowledge which has now become this very forlorn deserted mm. there's actually um, a couple of pieces by you outside here from a, a series you did called um, the last supper uh, which mm. I, I don't know if people know them or not but they're worth a look on your way back out um, and they're, they're they're amongst your um, I think one of your most powerful works and they've got all that in them They've got all that history of sort of religion and darkness and that. But it, it might just be worth quickly uh, telling us what those are about because people can see them on the way yeah. out. Um, so they are photographs of the meals chosen by prisoners on death row before they're executed. And I'd seen a colour spread of something similar like 20 years ago in the Sunday Times. But they were... Good paper. Did you see them? I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was an excellent spread, uh, but too colourful, I thought. <laughs> the um, pictures were taken from directly above, and there was like a red or blue plastic trays, and they had a flash on them, very lurid colours, but it was like a cheeseburger and fries and stuff. But I couldn't get that those pictures out of my head because they were just so poignant. And it took me a long time, because I'm quite slow in the way that I process things. After about 20 years, I thought, hmm, if you shot those last meals on death row as 17th century Dutch still life paintings, then instead of looking at them just as cheeseburger and fries and chicken wings, then you were looking at them with all the uh, the dressing that you uh, ad adopt when you look at a Nacho Morte painting. They're vanitas paintings. They're about the brevity of life and the the meaninglessness of the accumulation of worldly goods and, and mortality, essentially. And so you can project those thoughts onto something that's extremely mundane, like some uh, 
market of chicken wings. <laughs> and these things were the choices of people, and there were often things like breakfast cereal in there or food that was specific to a certain ethnicity, usually Afri African-American or, or Mexican, because they're by far the biggest um, groups on death row. And so you start to kind of experience the prisoners through these the portraits of the food they'd eaten, and they become like these surrogate portraits of the of, of the prisoners, um, and these and this very mundane stack of food suddenly takes on this quite sacred significance, mm. um, and they're framed in these kind of black, thick, black, heavy frames that you'd find in like Spanish museums to give them this kind of somber, like kind of um, almost gravestone type um, tableau to be hung on the wall. Gravitas, yeah. If, if, if I was choosing a last meal, I'd go for sort of, you know, langoustine and truffles and caviar. But these guys, it's like Rice Krispies, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And a, a McDonald's. Lots, uh, lots of sweetness, lots of fat, lots of comfort eating, which is like an extra sad fact of it that they they possibly going back to a place when their time was kind of happy you know when they were a kid and they just yeah, eating indeed. ice cream and stuff and yeah okay um just we're going to get on to some questions in a minute from the audience but just just finally I, I know you're on working on a very very ambitious and fascinating sounding project at the moment for your as if we can talk about it already your next show a little bit perhaps about that for the audience Okay, so I am going to be opening, God willing, on the 17th of May at Somerset House, part of Photo London, and I've made an exhibition which is a virtual reality experience, not a medium I thought I particularly want to work in, I don't like having to handle stuff when I go into the gallery or touch anything, but the medium's been around for quite a long time and I always knew that I wanted to do something with it because it deals with making a simulation of the real world and experiencing the world through like an artificially generated image. And it's by far the most effective ways of having totally immersion in the image. So I knew that I'd probably have to try and do it, but I couldn't find a project that was like an idea or like uh, something more than just a magic wow experience. And then I heard about this first proper exhibition of photography, which happened in 1839. And it was the first time the public had walked into a room and seen a photograph. The first time that an image of the outside world had been fixed on paper through science and was like a, a like a an absolute replica of what the world was like. And a stunning moment and the birth of everything that comes after it that we know today as photography and video and film, all image based technologies that we're now saturated by this whole deluge came from this kind of one moment. It's a little exaggeration. But this exhibition was the first proper public exhibition of photography. And so I thought if I recreate this exhibition as a virtual reality experience, then it will appear like you're walking around a room in 1839 experiencing the, the, the neo-Gothic interior, the burning fire, the vitrines, and actually what you're really experiencing is this latest up-to-date 2017 technology. So you're looking through the window of the new technology back through the window of the birth of that technology back into the real world. And I was developing this idea for a little while and kind of into it, but then I heard that at the same time this exhibition was happening that there was a lot of chartist demonstrators in London and in Birmingham and in various big cities around the country. And these guys, as well as wanting representation in Parliament and wanted to get the vote, they were also very suspect about certain technological developments which were potentially taking their jobs away from them due to factory autom automation, the Industrial Revolution. And so I thought that if I put these guys outside the window, breaking out of the window of the, my room, breaking shop windows and burning torches and smashing stuff up and shouting very angrily, then I could have a little glimpse of the social repercussions of this advancing technology. So I could say something about this digital revolution that we're going through, which is possibly likely to take away apparently more jobs than the Industrial Revolution ever did because of factory automation through robots and 
and uh, all routine work is going to go to algorithms. So I could address this contemporary problem by going back to the birth of photography. So you're going to have this exhibition room from 1839, then outside this ferment, this spectre of, um, of, of the, the social implications of the Industrial Revolution kind of going on outside the windows. So that's basically the project. And um, there's quite a few other little things that'll go in there. I've got about six people in the room at the same time wandering around. Each person is indicated by like a little ghostly aura, which will show other people where they are to prevent collisions, but also to yeah. kind of get in the mood of going back and haunting the past in this, in this old exhibition.